Andrea, um, Dr. Gauri Shankar's group work here. And uh, so there is interest on that. And, um, and today, uh, I mean, your group has found a very interesting link between genome instability and inflammation, uh, which is very exciting. And, um, and uh, you also, your work also, a lot, a lot of it links to cancer, um, like how these processes contribute to cancer initiation and progression. Uh, so today he's, uh, he will be talking about replication stress across the cell boundaries. Welcome, Philip. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. Hope you can see it. Is it is it working? Is it fine? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Who is uh, Lisa? Where is it? Okay, so here we go. So, um, well, thank you very much, Taviani, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure. It's my first, uh, actually, my first uh, seminar in, in India. So <laughs> it's the first time. I'm, I'm really glad to be with you, even if it's not in person. So, yeah, as Taviani uh, mentioned, I'm, I'm, uh, my lab is interested in DNA replication and replication stress. And um, I'm I'm a yeast biologist by training, and over the years, our work has evolved from pure DNA replication uh, topics into something that is more, I mean, it's really directing us into uh, immunity. Uh, but, but you will see that it's, it's clearly not my, uh, it, it's, it's really going beyond my, my uh, comfort zone in a way. <laughs> so I'm still a bit uh, uncomfortable about, uh, on, about uh, immu immunity concepts, but I think it's in, indeed a very interesting uh, interface. So um, th this is, uh, I guess, not all of you have, uh, are, are very familiar with DNA replication. So I, I prepared some uh, general introduction on, on the main concepts I'm going to be talking about today. And uh, he, do not hesitate to interrupt me, uh, of course, if, uh, if I'm too fast or if I have things that are not enti entirely clear. So, uh, so this is the, 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 the kind of um, event we are interested in, which is uh, uh, basically the, what we call replication stress. And, and replication stress refer to any kind of event where replication forks, the progression of replication forks is going to be impeded. Uh, it could be by any event, like uh, I, I will be talking a lot about conflicts between replication and transcription, but it could be due to the lesions or tightly bound uh, the uh, protein bound complexes. I mean, any, any situation that blocks a replication fork is potentially a problem for the cell and it has to be dealt with very efficiently. So what we and, and others have shown over the years is that uh, when the fork stalls, uh, it, the, the nascent DNA has to be remodeled in order to, to restart the replication fork. And, and the key event in this process is what we call the, the resection of nascent DNA, which is basically the degradation of nascent DNA by nucleases to generate single-stranded DNA. So it is, uh, in, initially it was mostly seen as, as a pathological transition and it was uh, uh, made very clear that this process has to be very tightly controlled in, or, in order to prevent the collapse of the replication fork, because if the fork collapses, if it cannot be rescued by a fork coming from the opposite direction, then it, uh, uh, um, a region in the genome will re remain unreplicated, and this is going to cause problems in, in mitosis. So uh, the, this um, resection of nascent DNA has to be very closely controlled. Uh, yet this is just to um, show you that in, in, in reality, we assume that most of this resection is not occurring uh, on a linear fork like that, but on a, on a structure called the reverse replication fork where nascent DNA re-anneals and the, it is believed that the nucleases are acting on this uh, structure here that looks like a, a double strand break. Um, in, in the rest of my talk, I will not show these structures because it makes the models much more complicated, but just bear in mind that this is kind of structure that is a substrate for most of the nucleases. 
Okay, so the point I want to make here is that this resection has to be very tightly controlled. Uh, it is uh, promoted by histone modifications and it is uh, prevented by um, um, mostly by enzymes involved in the homologous recombination like, like BRCA2 and BRCA1 and ras 61 And uh, these the enzymes are very important, these, these complexes are, are very important for preventing the over resection of the stalled folks. And in, in BRCA2 deficient cells, for instance, there is a, clearly an, an extended resection that leads to eventually to fog collapse. But yeah, the point I want to make here is that this resection, this, this degradation of an DNA is, is, uh, is important for uh, many functions. Uh, first of all, because single-stranded DNA that is generated is a signal for the activation of the ATR check one, uh, checkpoint. So this is going to signal to the rest of the cell that something is going wrong and that uh, many processes are going to be uh, controlled by this uh, checkpoint signaling. And also the single-stranded DNA is a substrate for homologous recombination mediated uh, repair of the fork. And, and some years ago, we have shown that um, the, the cohesin complex is loaded at stored replication fork and, and this, the presence of an excess of single-stranded DNA is important to load cohesin at the, at the stalled forks. So in other words, we, we believe that uh, too much resection is toxic for the cell, but some resection is needed to signal and to repair the stalled replication forks. So some years ago, we, we collaborated with uh, many labs uh, and um, to, to the characterization of, of the function of a, a new factor called SAMHD1. <coughs> so we got interested into SAMHD1 because SAMHD1 was initially known as a, as a DNTPase. So it's a, it's, a, it's a protein that is encoded by the human genome that encodes a, a, a factor that forms a tetramere and that regulates the DNTP pools in non-cycling cells. And this, this is super important for, um, the, to protect the cells against viruses and especially retroviruses, because by keeping DNTP pools at low levels in, in non-cycling cells, it will prevent the, the reverse transcription of viruses like HIV. So since we are interested in replication, we thought that uh, studying this uh, potential DNTP regulating enzyme was, could be important for replication in human cells. But it very quickly it happened that uh, it's not the case, at least in cycling cells, because when the cells go into S phase, uh, this enzyme gets phosphorylated and, uh, and the phosphorylated form it disassembles, uh, is no longer forming a tetramere. And, it, and then it has a new function. It's not, no longer degrading the entities, but then it has a new function. And, and we found with, uh, within this collaboration that some SG1 is actually uh, interacting physically with MR11 and it's stimulating the nuclease activity of MR11 to promote the resection of nascent DNA. And this is um, an, an in vitro experiment done by Lumia Klechi showing that indeed uh, the phosphorylated form of SIMG1 uh, interacts with MR11 and stimulates its nuclease activity, its exonuclease activity in vitro. So th this was. Uh, uh, basically a new regulator of fog resection. Now, uh, what is really interesting is the phenotype of the cells that are uh, missing this enzyme. And um, so the some SG1 deficient cells are interesting because they are, uh, uh, at least some SG1 is frequently mutated in the Icardi-Gutierrez syndrome. And the Icardi-Gutierrez syndrome is a syndrome of uh, uh, Patients with this syndrome have a chronic activation of type 1 interferons. And uh, especially, uh, it's especially a problem in the brain because patients, uh, they end up with a massive inflammation in the brain. Uh, it, so it's basically like uh, if you're infected with a pathogen, but there is no detectable pathogen in the, in the brain of this patient. So they die because of this massive inflammation. It's, it's, a, very, uh, it's a very severe disease. So what happens in, in, at, at the replication fork in these SAMH1 depleted cells? Well, what we found is that MR11, instead of degrading cytosolic DNA, is actually doing another function, which is to uh, uh, cut the flaps that are generated by a helicase called, called RACU1. So 
what, what we detected in these sam one depleted cells is that the, the nascent DNA, instead of being degraded upon fork arrest, it is displaced from the fork and event, eventually it accumulates in the cytosol where it is detected by the CGAS sting pathway. So this pathway is, is a key sensor of uh, cytosolic nucleic acids, and it's normally there to prevent the infection by pathogens, but it's also there to, to sense um, uh, you know, that something is going wrong in the cell. Uh, for instance, if there is a massive lysis of mitochondria, this is going to activate the sting pathway. Uh, and if there is DNA damage, uh, there is also activation of the, the sting pathway. So, so what is interesting in, in this uh, study is that uh, in, in, this, in, the, in the replication stress situation, if some HD1 is not there to control the proper resection of nascent DNA, then there is a, a chronic activation of the uh, interferon response. So what is interesting also is that uh, besides some HD1, there is, uh, yeah, uh, there is a, another uh, nuclease called TREX1. That I, I'm going to talk about TREX1 in a minute. Uh, which is uh, important to degrade cytosolic DNA, to regulate cytosolic DNA levels. So when strex one is not there, even if some H1 is there, there is an accumulation of cytosolic DNA uh, pool, and this is also leading to chronic uh, type 1 interferon production. And yet there is another factor mutated in, in the Cardiogutia syndrome, which is RNAs H2, and, and that's another enzyme I'm going to tell you more in a minute. Uh, and RNAs H2 is, is also known to be important for the removal of ribonucleotides that are incorporated uh, in the DNA. Okay, so why is it important, this connection between replication stress, DNA damage, and inflammation? Because we believe now that it, this is really the, a, a key event in the connection between, um, uh, you know, cancer, for instance, the, the effect of chemotherapy in cancer treatment and the elimination of cancer cells. Because anytime you are going to create damage into cancer cells using either chemotherapy or radiotherapy, uh, cytosolic DNA is produced and, and the sigasting pathway gets activated. And it was shown very clearly by many labs that uh, if you have a hyperactivation of this pathway, you are going to uh, attract the, you get an increase in filtration of immune cells into the tumor, and this is going to promote, to stimulate the immunogenic cell death. So now it's, it, there are more and more people thinking that whenever we treat cancer cells with chemotherapy, uh, we are not directly killing the cancer cells through cytotoxic effects, but we are just making the, the tumor cells more visible to the immune system and it's actually the immune system that eliminates the cancer cells. So understanding, getting a better understanding of, of this connection uh, between replication stress, DNA damage, and inflammation is probably key to improve uh, current and, and future anti-cancer treatments, especially those in, involving uh, inhibitors of ch um, uh, checkpoint, um, uh, um, immune checkpoints, sorry. I probably heard about anti PD1, anti PDL1 treatments that improve the rejection of the, the cancer by the, the, the immune system. And uh, the, these, these treatments are extremely efficient against cancer, but they only work on the subpopulation of tumors uh, that are visible to the, that are called like hot tumors that are visible to the immune system. And many cold, so called cold tumors are escape immunotherapy because they are there are no uh, infiltration in the tumor and, and, uh, and these uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors are, are not functional. But if we manage to make these cells feasible to the immune system by stimulating this, this connection, then we expect that uh, this is going to improve cancer treatment. So I'm not going to tell you more about uh, this aspect of cancer for now. Uh, and I will use uh, my, my, most of my time to, to tell you about uh, the link between replication stress and inflammation in oncogene-induced senescence. So what is oncogene-induced senescence? It is a process that leads to uh, an arrest in cell proliferation and leads to the, 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 the senescence of the cells. 
And uh, it was very well described in many systems. For instance, when cells are overexpressing an oncogenic form of RAS, uh, it was shown by many labs that uh, there is an increased uh, deregulated tra transcription with an increase in the loops. This is causing replication stress. This replication stress uh, activates the DNA damage response, including P53 and P21. And this eventually leads to the, the senescence of the cells. And the senescence is, is also le leads to a, a specific um, secretory phenotype of uh, many uh, cytokines and, and pro-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines that, that sort of uh, reinforce the senescence process. So this is a classical way that has been described uh, many years ago. But uh, more recently, uh, there was, it was shown by, by different groups that there is also a contribution of uh, cytosolic DNA and the sigastin pathway to induce uh, uh, senescence. So it was shown that in, in RAS induced cells, for instance, if you prevent, if you knock down sigas or sting, then you, you block completely the senescence process. So now we, we, we have two, like, two uh, different uh, branches of the two different pathways that leads to, to senescence in oncogenic new cells. And what, what I'm, uh, I will try to, to convince you about today is that these are actually two connected uh, processes and that somehow uh, the cytosolic DNA and sigasting activation could be also connected to replication stress in the context of senescence. But before I, I go into that, I wanted to tell you uh, briefly about some unpublished results we have in the lab about this connection between uh, transcription, deregulation, loops, and, and replication stress. Uh, okay, so, so what, what, what is it? Uh, what, what is it known about that? So loops are, are RNA-DNA hybrids uh, forming when uh, the nascent RNA re annihilates with uh, the, the template DNA during transcription. So it formed this structure with a displaced DNA loop. Uh, and this structure is, is believed to be very stable. And uh, it was shown by many groups that uh, it can be an obstacle for replication forks, uh, presumably because its structure is very stable. Um, so people have shown also that it, the, the conflict will depend very much on the orientation of the two processes. So if uh, replication and transcription are, are, are oriented in the head and fashion, then this will increase the probability of uh, breakage uh, at the replication fork and, and generic instability. But still the mechanism is, is um, how, how you know, these structures are actually blocking the, the progression of the fork uh, is still very much um, unclear. So uh, to, to what we know also uh, from the work of uh, people like Fred Shedan, who developed technologies, techniques to, to map our loops in the genome, is that these structures are extremely abundant uh, in, the, in the human genome. We can, he showed that probably up to 5% of the genome is covered by uh, our loops. So the question is really, you know, if these structures are, are toxic for application folks, is it that any R loop in the genome is going to be a, a, a problem for the fork? Or, or could it be that you know, there is a subpopulation of toxic R loops that, that could be more of a problem? Uh, the, the, the thing is that there is no like another, uh, another view of uh, replication transcription conflicts in, in untreated cells. So, so what uh, the, the challenge we, 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 we started some years ago, and this is now published, is to, was to, to map uh, both the R loops and the stored replication fork in the human genome. So again, this was a collaboration with many groups, uh, mainly because this, this uh, study involved a lot of uh, omics uh, approaches. So we used uh, RNA-seq and GrowSeq to position uh, transcription, ongoing transcription in, in HeLa cells. We used the DRIP-seq technique developed by uh, Fred Shedan to, to map the position of R loops in the genome. And, and we used uh, OKSeq, Okazaki fragment sequencing, uh, to, to map the, the direction of the replication forks in, in the human genome, uh, together with Chulong Shen, who contributed to the development of this technique. 
And then finally, we mapped uh, replication stress sites by uh, doing a chip seek analysis of uh, RPA, phosphorylated RPA and gamma H2X. So uh, RPA2 is phosphorylated on serin 33 by ATR. Uh, so it, we, we use that as a proxy for the local activation of ATR. So an indication of where the, the replication fault is supposed to, to be blocked. And finally, we used a technique called BLESS to map double strand breaks in the genome in conditions of replication uh, transcription conflict. So again, this is published. So I'm not going to give you uh, all the story, just the, the take home message. So, so we got some very complex maps like that, where we could position the R loops, the phosphor RPA, the default directions, the transcription uh, direction, and so on and so forth. And uh, if I integrate all that information in, in a very simple model, that, that was the main conclusion of the paper, uh, uh, the, is that uh, basically the, the, the human genome is organized in a way to limit replication transcription conflicts. So uh, uh, what we and others have shown is that uh, origins are often localized upstream of active genes. So anytime there is a highly transcribed gene, uh, there is an open chromatin uh, region in the promoter region. And this is uh, going to be used by the replication machinery to assemble active origins. And, and so in gene-rich regions, most of the initiation of replication will start upstream of gene, which means that when the fork progresses through the gene, mostly it will replicate the gene in the co-directional manner. So avoiding therefore the, the, the frontal conflicts between replication and transcription. Yet the fog that moves in the opposite direction will eventually meet a gene in a head-on orientation. And when this happens, we show that this is happening at the, at the transcription termination site of the gene. And uh, so what, what we showed in, in this paper is that whenever there is this kind of conflict, there is a posing of the replication fog, potentially mediated by uh, by uh, topological uh, constraints, like, uh, like the accumulation of positive supercoating. Uh, and this transient uh, uh, activation of ATR will, will ensure the, the, the stability of the post fork, and then the fork will restart. So how does the fork avoid all of these uh, replication machineries? Well, we think that uh, it's, it's probably just waiting for transcription to, to stop. Uh, so how can we um, say that? Well, people have shown that if you, if, you, if you follow transcription at the single cell level, uh, you actually see that transcription is not a continuous process, but it's very discontinuous. Here you see the transcription of a, of a specific uh, locus. You see that the transcription is on and then it's off, then it's on again and so on. So over time, you can measure that there are uh, bursts of transcription uh, that are followed by period where basically no transcription is detectable in the locus. So whenever a fork uh, encounters a transcription, an active transcription unit, we believe that the, the, the buildup of positive supercoding is, is seen as a signal for the fork to, 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 to stall. So you can imagine, you can see it as a, as a, as a like a traffic light. And when um, uh, transcription eventually stops, then this positive supercoding will eventually disappear or will be dissolved by topoisoporesis. And then the traffic light turns green again and then replication can restart. So meaning that in most of the genome, replication and transcription will be either co-directional or regulated in a way that uh, conflicts are, are very limited. And that's why we believe that well, it, cells are very well equipped with mechanisms to avoid uh, conflicts. So now, uh, why conflicts still uh, occur? Because they can be detected by genetic means or by specific assays. <coughs> we believe that they, they are not very frequent, but still they, they exist. So how do cells, especially how do cells deal with these RNA-DNA hybrids? So again, we, we believe that the, the cell is very well equipped with mechanisms to, to uh, bypass these, these uh, roadblocks. Uh, for instance, we know now that ATR is coordinating the, the, the modifications and the, the displacement of, of stalled RNA polymerases. 
And enzymes like senataxin and RNAs-H are also very efficiently uh, displacing or degrading RNA-DNA hybrids ahead of the replication force. So that's also one of the reasons why, uh, in general, this kind of conflicts is not causing problems because the cells are, have learned how to avoid them or to resolve them whenever they, they, they happen. Yet, uh, our, our DNA hybrids could be a problem. So, so if they are not causing replication for the rest, how could they be a problem in the cell? Well, there's an alternating model that was proposed by uh, uh, different labs where, you know, if you, if you consider that the replicative helicase is actually acting on the opposite strand as the hybrid when the fork is in an head-on orientation, then you could imagine that the, potentially this leading strand synthesis could slide beyond the position of the hybrid and then convert a, st a structure that is ahead of the fork into a situation where now the, 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 the hybrid is transferred behind the replication forks. And, and what I, I will show you now in a minute, and that's some studies, uh, unpublished study that we are finishing at the moment, we believe that the, the toxicity comes precisely from the fact that the, the hybrid is no longer ahead of the fork where cells can um, equip to deal with it, but now it's, it's behind the fork and potentially it could interfere with the processes that I was mentioning at the beginning, like resection and reversion of the replication fork. So how can we prove that? Um, well, uh, I told you that um, uh, there are different types of RNAs-H. Uh, RNAs-H2 that I was mentioning before is important to remove the uh, rib ribonucleotide incorporated into DNA. And RNAs-H1 and H2 are also important to degrade long RNA-DNA hybrids. So we, we reason that if uh, these structures are a problem for stalled replication forks, then if we remove the RNAs H activity and then induce the posing of the replication fork, then the, 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 the problem should uh, accumulate and, and become really toxic. So that's what we, we did uh, in, uh, in two systems, in budding yeast and in human cells. We studied the phenotype of RNAs H depleted cells to see whether indeed they have replication fork restart problems. So here are cells, yeast uh, colonies that uh, are uh, either wild type or deleted for RNAs H1, RNAs H2, or both RNAs H activities. And, and you can see that in the absence of drugs, the colonies are, are, are growing just fine. Uh, so even in total absence of, uh, of uh, RNAs H activity, you see that the cells are growing to the same extent as uh, control cells, as, as wild type cells. But now if we expose the cells to low doses of hydroxyurea or MMS, to induce replication for rest. Now you see that uh, um, RNAsH mutants are, are totally dead, okay? So wh what is causing this lethality? So uh, remember I told you that when the fork pose, so here we have a situation where it's arrested with MMS, the nascent RNA uh, DNA behind the fork is going to be resected to expose uh, um, single stranded DNA. And this single stranded DNA uh, is, uh, is going to be protected by RPA, which is a uh, single-stranded DNA binding protein. So we in yeast, we can measure the, this uh, formation of single-stranded DNA and, RNA, uh, and RPA binding by uh, doing a chip, uh, uh, a ch a, a, a chromatin immunoprecipitation of uh, uh, single-stranded DNA uh, bound, bound by RPA. So this is uh, two uh, examples of replication or, uh, origins in budding yeast. So we know that uh, from these origins, the fork in, in the presence of MMS at this concentration, we replicate about 4 kb of DNA. So if we look behind the fork uh, in, in control cells, we can detect the accumulation of RPA, which is indicative of the resection activity. But you see that if we deplete both RNAsH1 and RNAsH2, now this resection activity is completely prevented and, and we, we lose completely the presence of RPA behind the fork. Then we use the technique called DNA combing to, to stretch DNA fibers along uh, class fibers. And we measure the distance covered by uh, replication forks by incorporating the RNA. 
So what we did was to measure the distance covered by the fork uh, in wild type SARS exposed to MMS. So during the MMS exposure, the forks, the tracks were about 20 kb long. And then after removal, we can measure the restart, the efficiency of the cells to restart the replication fork. And you can see that uh, the, the length of the, of the BRD tracks is, is doubling in the control cells after the recovery from MMS. But if we don't have um, RNAs H and uh, H1 and H2, you see that this recovery uh, efficiency is, is very strongly reduced indicating that indeed RNSH activities are important for the, the efficiency of fork restart. Um, I will skip that because it's really for aficionados, but um, then we moved to human cells and we did the, the very same experiment, uh, measure, measuring the resection of NSN DNA in the absence of RNSH activities. So in, in human cells, the, the process is a bit different. So we label uh, ongoing replication with uh, two pulses of IDU and CLDU. And then we expose the cells to hydroxyurea. So in, a, in the presence of hydroxyurea, there is resection of nascent DNA. And so if we measure the ratio of IDU to CLDU, this ratio is normally close to one in control cells. And then it goes beyond uh, below one if, if resection is occurring. So this is measured on stretched DNA fibers on, on glass slides again. And we measure about 200 uh, individual replication forks to determine the, the, the fork rate and the resection. So you, you can see that in control cells, uh, there is an efficient resection of nascent DNA because uh, CLDU tracks are getting shorter and the, the ratio now is, is clearly be, uh, smaller than, than one. Uh, so if we deplete RNAs H1, we get a slight reduction of this resection rate, but not, not much, not spectacular. But now, uh, if we deplete either uh, RNAs H2A or H2B, the two subunits of uh, RNAs H2, now you see that the resection activity is completely propagated. So just like in yeast, it looks like uh, the RNAs H2 activity is super important to promote the resection of nascent DNA. So, um, now remember, we, we, we think that uh, this is caused by RNA-DNA hybrids, and these hybrids are, are, are generated by transcription. So we thought if we have a defect in, in resection at the supposed replication forks, if it's, this is caused by R loops, if we prevent the formation of R loops by inhibiting transcription, then we should rescue the resection of the forks. So to address this possibility, we use two types of uh, uh, transcription inhibitors. DRB and triptolide. And uh, to our surprise, uh, in the presence of DRB, the resection defect was, was still present. So again, uh, the control cells they are fully able to resect nascent DNA, but not the uh, RNAs H2 deficient cells. Uh, but if we treat the cells with triptolide instead of DRB, now we can restore uh, uh, the resection of the forks. So what does this tell us? Again, these are two transcription inhibitors. So one, why one is rescuing the phenotype and not the other? So we looked at uh, the uh, efficiency of transcription inhibition with the two inhibitors, and it's very similar, looking at EO incorporation, very, very similar levels. We looked at the formation of RNA-DNA hybrids. And uh, so this is done on slab blots, and this is a quantitation. So you can see that um, uh, when, you, when we treat cells with uh, either DRB or triptolide, we, we get a very strong reduction of the, the, the frequency of uh, RNA-DNA hybrids in the genome. And you see that the depletion of uh, H2A is not really changing much the, the amount, okay? But finally, we looked at the level of RNA polymerases in the cell, and now we saw a very strong difference, which is that uh, and this was already published, already known, that when you treat cells with, uh, with uh, DRB, this is not affecting the amount of uh, RNA polymerase in the cell. But if you treat cells with triptolide, then the RNA polymerase gets very quickly degraded. You can see here the differences. In both cell types, there is not only a reduction in R loops, but also in the reduction in uh, um, uh, total RNA polymerases. 
So this is the model where we, 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 we came up with. We, what we think is that when, whenever this kind of event happens, it's super important that uh, both the RNA polymerase and the hybrid are removed in a coordinated uh, manner. So if this, this uh, removal is not coordinated, then potentially you could end up with a situation like that where the, the hybrid is transferred from in front of the fork to behind the fork. And now we are creating, creating a situation that is toxic for the, the processing of the replication fork. So if RNSH is present, then it can remove uh, this, this structure and then the fork can restart. But if RNSH is mutated, then the resection of nascent DNA is going to be prevented. And this will impede the, the, the recovery of the soil force. Okay, so this is something we, we are just about, a story we are just about to, to, to submit for publication. Um, now I'm getting back to this question of uh, um, uh, how RAS is inducing senescence in the cells. So what I showed you now from until now is that we believe that it's probably uh, uh, by deregulating transcription and replication at the same time, it's probably increasing this replication stress, uh, presumably through the RNAsH dependent process. And eventually this leads to senescence. And the question now we ask is whether the branch leading to senescence through the inflammatory process, whether these, these are independent processes or whether they are connected, right? So how did we address this question? So some years ago, we were uh, studying how cells adapt to RAS-induced senescence. And, and we did a very simple experiment, which is to start from immortalized BJ fibroblasts, induce RAS into these cells, so to, to uh, promote oncogene-induced senescence. And then, so normally, the vast population of cells will, will stop dividing. But if you wait long enough, Eventually, we see clones that escape the senescence process and they, they restart growing. So what we did was to pick several of these clones and, and study them temporarily. And, and what we found, yeah, here is an example. You see the, the RAS of the BJ cells of the BJ RAS cells, they, they, they grow very slowly, but these clones, they, they can grow much faster, although they, 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 they keep expressing uh, RAS. And so what was very interesting in these clones uh, you see the RAS expression that is maintained, but you see that in, in most of them, uh, what we detected was a very high overexpression of uh, factors that are like claspin and timeless that are tightly associated to the replication fork and make the fork more resistant to, to replication stress. And this is interesting because this overexpression of claspin and timeless and also check one to some extent is something that we observed in, in the primary, uh, in, in, um, in samples from uh, cancer patients. So we found it in primary breast cancer, in, in primary uh, colon cancer, and in also in, 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 uh, in lung cancer, in, in non-small small cell lung cancer. And uh, uh, this is published again, so I, don't, I, I will not uh, go through the details, but what is interesting is that this overexpression of factors is a, a fork associated factors, is protective against replication stress, and it makes the cells more uh, resistant to, uh, to, to this endogenous replication stress. And it, this is associated with a, a poor uh, prognosis for the patients. So how did we show that it affects re the replication fork speed and, and, and stability? Well, uh, th so this is again, the, the speed of the fork that is uh, measured by, along DNA fibers. So um, uh, what, what we found is that the speed of the replication fork is reduced when RAS, the oncogene RAS is induced because RAS is causing replication stress. So we can visualize the replication stress directly as, as a reduction in the replication fork speed. And you see that the, in the clones that escape the senescence induced by RAS, uh, they also uh, manage to, to bypass this replication Fox slow down uh, precisely because they overexpress claspin and timeless. And if we deplete claspin and or timeless in the cells, now you can restore the slow fork phenotype, which is associated to uh, replication stress. And this is true in the other clones also. 
Okay, so so uh, uh, what what we we what we knew and that was not um, I mean we we knew that there was this paper linking replication stress to inflammation. So we thought, okay, what what if we would look at the induction of the interference stimulated genes in, in these populations uh, of cells? And and so what, what we observed was. Uh, very uh, consistent with the published data is that when BGS cells that have no induction of the uh, interferon genes are now expressing RAS, they have this oncogene replication stress, and now they, they show this very strong induction of interferon stimulated genes, indicating that the, the, the RAS uh, mediated oncogen oncogenic stress is causing an inflammatory response in the cells. And what is super nice is that in the clones, like the clone four and five, that overexpress claspin and timeless and escape uh, replication stress. Now you, see, you can see that they are also suppressing the induction of the interferon stimulated genes. So as if the, the, the induction of interferon genes was a direct consequence of the, the replication stress induced by the oncogenes. So we came with a model in which maybe uh, the, uh, the replication stress that is induced by RAS is maybe causing the accumulation of cytosolic DNA, and then by inducing the segasting process, might actually connect these two branches of the, the senescence uh, pathway. So how can we test that? Uh, first of all, we looked at the amount of cytosolic DNA in the cells, and to do so, we, have, uh, we are collaborating with a, a, a biophysicist to develop a uh, a kind of um, um, microfluidic approach to detect and, and quantify cytosolic DNA. So uh, I will not go into the details. Uh, this is, you can find some more information in, in this publication on the system, just to show you that we can detect uh, the accumulation of cytosolic DNA and, and quantify and determine its size. So here it's, it's a gel-like representation of what we measured, but you can see that uh, in cells, for instance, that are depleted for TREX1. Remember, TREX1 is this enzyme that uh, degrades cytosolic DNA. So if you knock down TREX1, you, you, you just accumulate cytosolic DNA uh, by default. And you can see that we can very nicely detect this accumulation in the cells. There is, there is all this population of fragments in between two, 200 and 300 uh, nucleotides or base pairs they are accumulating in the absence of, uh, of, of TREX1. And they are very, you can detect a very low level in the presence of TREX1. So how about RAS induced cells? Uh, just like TREX1 depletion, we could see that when RAS is induced, there is a huge increase of uh, cytosolic DNA in the small, in the same range of size. <clears throat> so potentially uh, suggesting that uh, they, they could be responsible for the induction of the interferon response. So that, that would be the idea. Uh, somehow in, in, upon RAS induction, there is more replication stress and there are cytosolic DNA fragments that are pre, uh, produced. And if they are not degraded by TREX1, then they would be uh, seen, sensed by the segasting pathway, induce this pro-inflammatory uh, response that would in, in, in return uh, reinforce the, the senescence process. So how can we manipulate the system to address this model? Remember that in, in the same g one depleted cells, we could detect a lot of cytosolic DNA. Here it's an it's a immunofluorescence uh, approach. So when the cells are exposed to hydroxyurea to block the replication force, we, we can see the, the accumulation of uh, this cytosolic DNA. And what we did in this experiment was to treat the cells with mirin, which is an inhibitor of MR11, the nuclease that is required for the release of these fragments. Now you see that there is no release of uh, cytosolic DNA anymore. Okay. So the prediction would be that if cytosolic DNA is important for the senescence process, if we prevent cytosolic DNA by treating with mirin, then we should uh, impede uh, senescence. So this is the experiment. So you see that uh, this is cell growth. So you see that uh, the control cells are growing slowly. The RAS induced cells are stop proliferating upon, upon induction of RAS. And now if in the same cells, if we treat uh, the cell, these cells with mirin, this is what we see. Now we see an unrestrained um, cell growth, despite the, the oncogenic stress. 
simply because the cells are now, uh, the MR11 activity is suppressed in these cells, okay? So this was uh, very surprising to us. So we wanted to make sure that indeed we block senescence by treating cells with mirin. So here we looked at another feature of senescent cells, which is the accumulation of uh, beta galactosidase activity. So these are the control cells. These, these are the RAS induced cells after eight, 14, or 21 days. And you see that if these cells are treated with uh, mirin, then we, we lose completely the induction of the, the beta gal in, in the cells. So we looked at many of our features, like the, the accumulation of heterochromatic foci, the production of SASP, and uh, the other incorporation, which is an indication of cell proliferation. In, in all these cases, I'm not going to show you all the data for any sake of time. We, we could show that uh, senescence is prevented simply by adding mirroring together with uh, the RAS induction. So this is our model that we, we think that somehow MR11, again, is connecting replication stress to cytosolid DNA. And this would be important to, to, to connect these two branches and to reinforce the, the senescence process. Uh, so one, one way to validate this model is cytosolid DNA is, is so important for uh, uh, the senescence process. Uh, we, we, we could potentially also manipulate the system by playing with uh, this TREX1 uh, enzyme. So remember, TREX1 is degrading cytosolic DNA. So if we overexpress TREX1, the prediction would be that there will be less cytosolic DNA, less induction of this branch. And so we should reduce the, um, the, the, the senescence process. So this is what we did. Here you have the beta gal activity. Uh, you see that upon RAS induction, the BGA cells, they, they start uh, engaging into senescence. But if we have, if we have a higher uh, amount of uh, TREX1 in the cytosol, then the senescence process is, is completely blocked, okay? Uh, so this is uh, just, a, I mean, it's a nice control, but it doesn't tell us much about the process. Uh, yet in this experiment, we, we did a, a, a very interesting control which was to, together with TREX1, overexpress uh, uh, um, catalytic dead mutant of TREX1. And this is interesting because this catalytic dead mutant is acting as a dominant negative. So whenever we overexpress this TREX1 D18N mutant, we, we completely suppress the endogenous activity of TREX1. So we have the opposite effect. We have no uh, TREX1 activity, so increased cytosolic DNA. And now, uh, we, we got the exact opposite phenotype, which is that now we get a massive uh, induction of, of senescence uh, that is even larger than when the RAS is induced alone. Okay. <coughs> now I would like to draw your attention to this point here, which is uh, a, a very surprising. Uh, you see that in this condition, we just have the dominant negative TREX1, and we don't have uh, RAS induction at all. And yet we get a very strong induction of senescence to the same extent as uh, uh, RAS induction alone, okay? So this would mean that we, we get senescence even in the absence of oncogene, which was very surprising. So we checked that, uh, uh, we looked at SARS and interferon stimulated genes. In these cells, we detected a very strong induction of inflammation. Um, so this is weird because uh, in a way, it means that we can reach senescence uh, just by activating this branch, even in the absence of RAS uh, at all. And, and this was a bit disturbing for us because we thought that still, uh, this was very important for the senescence process. So how, how can it then be? Well, we did some other experiments with, that, that were simply to add uh, to the, the BGA cells to in, directly add uh, interferon beta in the culture. And to our surprise, what we see, so here we are measuring the speed of replication force. So, so what, um, what, what we found is first, when we uh, overexpress TREX1, we have a slower replication force. And when we inhibit the activation of TREX1 with the dominant negative mutant, we get faster replication force. And this is sufficient to uh, uh, modulate the speed of replication force very unexpectedly. 
Uh, we also detected other marks of replication stress, like the accumulation of micronuclei and the formation of 53 big T1 foci. So simply by uh, inactivating on activity in the cytosol, then we got signs of replication stress and faster replication force. So this is what I was mentioning just before. If we add interferon beta in the culture, we also get faster replication force and we get a very strong induction uh, of, this, of the senescence process. So, uh, and this is our uh, working model at the moment. So what we think is that uh, replication stress is connected to cytosolic DNA and to inflammation, but the reverse is true. You have a feedback loop that links type one interferon and interferon stimulated genes to replication stress itself. And this was very nicely, this connection was very nicely shown by uh, the lab of uh, Lorenzo Penango in Zurich, where they showed that ISD15, which is one of the main interferon stimulated genes, is actually a, a, a small molecule, very similar to, to, to biotin. And uh, um, ISD15 can be used to, to modify replication factors and uh, by uh, overexpressing ISG15, this lab showed that uh, you can deregulate, you can get faster replication fork and increase replication stress simply by uh, overexpressing these factors. So, so now we, 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 our working model is that this, this uh, interferon response uh, pathway is actually, uh, we, we see it as a way to amplify the replication stress response induced by, by uh, oncogenes. So it would be like a, an, an auto-amplifying loop that would, uh, at, the, at the level of a given cell, um, increase replication stress and, and increase the senescence process, but also by, by communicating with other cells in the, in the microenvironment, also uh, make this signal more, more global. So we think that this is a, a general mechanism that is uh, involved in many biological processes. And uh, we, are, we are trying to also to finalize the, this paper. So one final word, and I, I will be done in two minutes, uh, about uh, this connection between uh, the inflammation, inflammatory, the replication stress response, inflammation, and back onto the replication fork and the replication stress response. We think it's a very general process. And uh, I, I will show you this example. So, so some years ago, we, we, we collaborated with uh, a, a with the lab of Sophie Yu at the Henri Mondor Hospital in Paris on a very strange uh, skin disease called Hydradenitis super, I never managed to say it, superativa. Uh, so it's, it's basically an, an inflammation of the, of the, 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 the uh, sorry, the, the, the follicle at the base of, the, of the, this, um, ah, sorry, anyway. Uh, you see what I mean. <laughs> so basically the follicle gets, gets a, a major inflammation. And this is a problem uh, the, the, that can be, it, it, there's no treatment basically for this disease. And you see here examples of, of the, the kind of lesions that patients get on their skin. It's very, uh, it's very painful. There is no treatment. The only way is to take skin uh, somewhere else on the, the body and, and replace the skin with, uh, with uh, intact skin. So uh, by trying to um, understand the, the, what causes this, this disease, uh, this lab was uh, interested in, in looking at the, the stem cells, the, what they call the bulge stem cells. And they found that in patients, there, is, there was a chronic inflammation uh, of, the, of the stem cells. And among the, the, the interferon genes that were stimulated, that they were induced, the, the most highly expressed was precisely ISG15. So the cells from these patients, they were growing uh, faster, they were at faster replication forks and they, have a, they had a spontaneous induction of the interferon pathway and they have spontaneous accumulation of DNA damage. So very similar to what we observed with, um, with, uh, in, in cells that are uh, depleted for some HG1. So we, we, we started the collaboration with this lab and they, they, they proposed us to look at the, the speed of replication forks in, in, the, in these uh, bulge cells from patients versus normal cells. So here you have normal hair follicles. Uh, 
and you see that we, we can measure speed of replication fog that is fairly constant between uh, the control uh, individuals. And these, these are the same cells, but from uh, patients suffering from this skin disease. And you see that the speed of replication faults can be uh, increased by almost threefold, which was really spectacular. And we never measured uh, such a fast replication faults in, 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 in any human cells types uh, before this study. So uh, you see that most of them are, are, are very, the speed of the fork is very much increased. But what, what was really super interesting is that if we depleted sting in, in some of these cells, now we can rescue or, or, or re have a, a, a speed of the replication fork that become, uh, that goes back to normal. So indicating that the, the increased speed of the fork was caused by this chronic induction of uh, interferon genes. So in this model, it, it, we came up with a model that is very similar to what we see in, in, the, in the senescent cells, which is that for some reason at some point, and we still don't know what is the, the causative event in this, in this disease, but somehow the, 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 the speed of the replication fork increases, which causes increased replication stress, which eventually leads to the accumulation of cytosolid DNA. And this is activating the CIGAS, the, actually the F IFI-16 sting pathway. And uh, potentially through the induction of IHG-15 is, is inducing faster forks, which causes even more replication stress, even more cytosolid DNA. And then you get a, a crazy uh, auto amplification of this loop that eventually lead to these very, very uh, extreme phenotypes of the cells with very fast replication fork, lots of information, and then all of these diseases. Um, yeah, well, so uh, I will stop here. I'm a bit over, over time. So uh, just to thank the people in my lab who, who did this work. So the, the, the lab was done at the Institute of Human Genetics in Montpellier. Uh, the people with the name marked in, in blue were involved in the second part of my talk on the senescence and inflammation. And people uh, with the name in, in dark bold are people who worked on the worked on the replication stress uh, part and outlooks. And and uh, I'm happy to take questions if, if you have any. Thank you. Hey. Philip, for the nice uh, talk. Uh, any questions? Devani, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, Ganesh, go ahead. So, uh, uh, Philip, uh, so first time I'm uh, meeting you. So, hello. Talk, excellent talk. And then Thank I have a couple of questions. Thank you very much. So, um, so, with your first part of the talk with the SAM HD1, so uh, in the cancer cells, especially when you're trying to go for a chemotherapeutic drugs as well as radiation therapy, yeah. So extensive <clears throat> DNA damage occurs as well as, you know, that goes with apoprotic cell death and things like that. So you also have a, a C-gas pathway. So wherein you have the immune cell activation and then that, uh, that's how it gets uh, cleared. So that way, which pathway is actually, you know, so uh, uh, predominant or is it both, uh, you know, function? So for clearing the cancer cells, especially during the treatment. So with the chemotherapeutic drugs or radiation therapy. Yeah, um, uh, I, f first of all, I, I don't know. Um, some HD1 is, is mutated in cancers, but, but it, it's doing so many different things that it's, it's quite difficult to, to make sense out of it. For instance, uh, as a DNTP hydrolase, it, has been, it was involved in the hydrolysis of some of the, the, the nucleotide analogs that are used for cancer treatments. So, so in this case, uh, the presence of SAMHG1 is important for, for treatment resistance. Uh, in other situations, it was associated potentially to, um, to uh, increase mutations, in, in, especially in the context of MMS, uh, in um, MSI um, type of cancer like, like colon cancer. So uh, because, you, you know, um, the, the, the pool of the NTPs is going, and especially the balance between the, the different four DNTPs is going to be very important to avoid mutations in the context where you have a mismatch repair. So in, in this situation, it's going to be a problem for uh, the appearance of cancers because you get increased mutations. Uh, in other situations, by in the absence of some easy one, for instance, you would have increased uh, 
inflammation. In this case, you would, ex you would expect that it's, uh, that it's anti-tumoral, but it's probably true at the beginning of the process. So what we think, I mean, the, in, in, in a more general term, this link between cancer and inflammation is very complex. So at the early stage, having more inflammation is going to be bad for the cancer because it will attract the immune system. But in the long run, if the, if the tumor manages to escape uh, the immune system and, and to, to further develop, then having a, this chronic um, global inflammatory environment is going to be positive for, for the cancer development, especially by promoting uh, um, the escape of the cancer cells and the, and the formation of metastasis. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult to answer your question in, in, a, in a simple way because there are many, many different scenarios and many ways this link between replication stress and inflammation is going to modulate the entire cancer response. So my second question is that, so when you have the replication transcription collisions, so you, you showed a very, very good model wherein the, you know, one of the model that where ATR activation actually, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you're also showing the RNA polymerase undergoing uh, ubiquitination and then undergoing mm -hmm. degradation. Is there a direct link with the ATR activation to uh, ubiquitination of the RNA polymerases and then their, uh, you know, subsequently it undergoes degradation or something like that? Any, any mechanism is known with that? Yeah, so it, it was pretty well uh, characterized in, in yeast and there are, mm -hmm quite a few papers that came out uh, more recently on, on human cells. So it's involving, you know, AT, it's, in, it's involving P97. I mean, the classical, you know, mechanisms to displace and degrade uh, uh, DNA bound protein complexes. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, this is um, regulated, uh, at least in yeast, it was shown nicely that it's, uh, it's regulated by, by MAC1, the ATR homologue of yeast. Yeah, thank and, you. And very there, there are specific, there is a specific uh, phosphomutant of uh, MEC1 that is enabled to, to, to do this job specifically, like, like a separation of function. Great, wonderful. So again, you know, so thank you for the wonderful talk. So, thank you. Uh, you know, hope to again, uh, you know, meet you sometime. And then so hope, uh, hopefully that you can visit India physically and then uh, give a talk here. Okay. Looking I, forward. Yeah. I will be happy to. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Devan, can I, can I ask? Sure. Uh, Philip, uh, very nice talk. So I have a couple of questions actually. So it always baffled me. So when you showed a couple of years back the single standard DNA in the cytoplasm, you know the amount was so mm -hmm. much. So my question is: so the CGAS sting activation is done with single standard DNA, or double standard DNA? Yeah, it's 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 done mostly on double standard DNA. So how okay. is because your mRNA is by looking at the polarity? Yeah, is yeah, actually, yeah. It's taken from the leading arm of the DNA. So how yeah. it becomes to the, so this still is, is, is a big curiosity for me, that one. Yeah, you, you probably noticed on that on, I, I was not very easy with that aspect on my model because I draw like single-stranded DNA getting out of the nucleus and then all of a sudden it becomes double-stranded. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I mean, we need to invoke double-stranded at some point because there is no evidence for CGAS binding single-stranded DNA. So, so you could imagine that either there is, uh, you could have secondary structures, like if you have inverted repeats, then you yeah. might form enough double-stranded DNA to, to form these multimers of, of CGAS. Um, it could be also because, you know, the, 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 we assume that the strands are displaced from, the, the single-stranded DNA, nascent DNA is displaced from both strands, right? Uh, so, so it could be that you have complementary sequences that, that form that we anneal. That, that, that could be an option. Uh, uh, it could be also that this uh, single-stranded DNA binds RNA and then is forming RNA-DNA hybrids that potentially could be detected by, by CGAS. Okay. So, or, or it could be there is some activity that converts single-stranded DNA into double-stranded DNA to make it uh, detectable. But we, yeah, we, we don't have any um, clue on so, that. According to your model, so basically it is usually done by the flap endonucleases, you know, usually the which are specifically acting on the flap, yeah. flap structure. Mm -hmm. So, but it is specific to MR11, but not let's say another flap endonucleases. No, no, we, we found this. I mean, we, we what we did in the in the 2018 paper with some H1, we we what we did was to start from this situation where we have lots of cytosolidine accumulating, 
And then you, we, we use a candidate approach to, to mutate many factors that could be potentially involved. And for instance, DNA2 was, uh, by depleting DNA2, it would strongly reduce the amount of uh, cytosolic DNA. Oh, okay. So, oh. yeah, I assume it's not only MR11, not only the endonuclease activity of MR11 that is important, but DNA2 can do the job too. Okay, so uh, sorry, an another question is, so when you remove the TREX1, so the amount of the fork speed you could increase is really yeah. baffling. So yeah. do you have the mechanism now, like what could be the, the re uh, mechanism behind the increase of the fork speed? Yeah, we, 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 we are working on that at the moment. Uh, we, we don't think it's a direct effect of uh, TREX1 itself. So it's, we don't think, I mean, we, we see the same thing by depleting completely TREX1, we see that the forks are faster. So, so we, we, we believe it's, uh, it's, uh, it's mediated by SIGAS and STEAM. And uh, for now, our best candidate is, uh, is uh, IST15, but uh, we haven't formally proved that yet. So, okay. so we, we assume that it's an uh, it's, um, yeah, interferon mediated kind of mechanism. Okay. So just, I have just, this is the last one. So now, now, you know, usually the MR11 is a very, uh, you know, fam, uh, favorite proteins for the people who believe in the fork reversal. Yeah. So you believe in that now or you are? Uh, uh, let's say I'm neutral. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think, I think the, the evidence that uh, Massimo Lopez and others have accumulated are, are, are quite convincing that somehow there is for crypto. So oh, I, I don't know what to what extent to, you know, there is a silly question of how much of what the people have, are seeing in, in, in vitro. I mean, after uh, removal of proteins is, is formed in vivo, is formed during the extraction of the proteins and the DNA. I think this is still questionable, but, but I, 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 I believe in the model where fork reversal could, could be acting as a, as a physiological mechanism to pose, to stall the replication, like a break, like a handbrake in a car. But yeah, I know it's still a controversial issue. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Thank you. Know, yeah, uh, this, uh, this is uh, only DNA. There is no bound proteins or in, anything in that. Yeah, we don't know actually. It's a, it's a, it's Remind like, me of uh, circulating chromatin in the, uh, yeah, so they is circulating chromatin yes. for sure. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, nucleosomes are known to be inhibitory for CGAS activation. So the CGAS binds very strongly to nucleosomes, and when it's bound to nucleosomes, it, it's uh, it's dead. So that's probably why CGAS is not sensing DNA in the nucleus. We know that there is a lot of nuclear CGAS actually, mm -hmm. and uh, the question was still uh, how what prevents CGAS from you know, signaling DNA all the time. And, and it's probably, the, the reason is probably the presence of nucleosomes. So, so that's why we think that, uh, uh, although there is probably nucleosomal DNA in the cytosol, it's, it's not uh, very well, uh, it's not sensing, uh, it's not activating the interferon response. It's mostly the-, the DNAs DNA. which you, you mm -hmm. propose, those are only DNA that you have tested. These circulating cytoplasmic DNAs. Yeah. <clears throat> well, sure at this point. Well, see, yeah, yeah. We actually we don't know. So we are we are investing much into this uh, microfluidic approach to be to be able to quantify more precisely what is single stranded DNA, double stranded, the size, the structure, the origin from the, the genome. Um, we 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 don't. We don't rule out the possibility that there are cytosol. I mean, this is proposed by the lab of uh, Kalin Simbridge that there is also uh, cytosolic RNA DNA hybrids uh, that would also signal to Sega sense thing. So I think it's, it's probably a mixture of a lot of things, and uh, it's probably very complicated. <laughs> so, Devyani, can I ask? Sorry, Devyani. Okay, okay, Shweta, go ahead. No, Shweta, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, very nice talk, Philip. I'm not from the field, but you made it easy for me to follow. Oh, thank so you. Thank you. Uh, I, I actually missed the conclusion about this RNA H2, why RNA Pol2 has to be degraded and not just oh, inhibited. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, I mean, it's, it's part of the, the model that we, we don't, uh, we don't, well, we are not 100% sure how, how it goes. 
Yeah, so so what, what we found is that one of the two inhibitors that we used were, was um, uh, re restoring the resection activity. Mm -hmm. and, and it was the one that, that also leads to the degradation of RNA polymerase. Right. So, you know, it's, it's only hand-waving. We, we don't know what, what the mechanism could be exactly. But... Um, yeah. So, was, so the question I had was, would, would this hold uh, kind of true for all the, even the dead uh, box RNA helicase, you know, if you were to uh, remove yeah. Paul II, yeah. they would also start? Yeah, we, frankly, we don't know. I mean, what, what the, the only strong uh, point that we can make here with this model is that because we are we are preventing the, the degradation of cytosolid of um, nascent DNA, uh, it, it necessarily means that the hybrid is behind the fork. You know, in this configuration, there is nothing preventing the fork from from being processed and restarted. And so, so we think that the, the, this is a classical textbook model that we see everywhere, where the the, the hybrid is acting as as a as a as a roadblock, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think that the, the main difference with our model is that it's if it's behind the fork, then it's not causing a problem per se. It's causing a problem in the in the in the post replicative manner. Now you see that in this model, if the fork was free to move indefinitely, then you could imagine that the the hybrid will remain on the on the lagging strand, and then the lagging strand polymerase they could reprime behind or after the hybrid, and the fork could keep going, you just end up with a gap that can pro process slightly. So, but in this model, you see that there is a, usually at termination sites, there are uh, many RNA polymerases that are piling up and then the fork will stop to, when it can counter the next polymerase and so on and so forth. So, so, so for this process to be regulated properly, especially if there is no RNA-SH activity, then mm -hmm. we think that we have to, we, we think that this has to be very tightly coordinated. You have to remove the RNA polymerases and uh, you, at the same time as you remove the, uh, the, the hybrid. Mm -hmm. So maybe that, that I'm not really answering your question, but you know, in anything that would slow down the, the displacement of the RNA polymerase, or you know, even T, like TF2H mutations that, that uh, make the, the polymerase backtrack when you have backtracking and then you have this, uh, our loop in front of the RNA polymerase, maybe we can also get into this toxic situation. And, and uh, there are probably many different situations that, uh, but we think it's, it's very important to, that everything is coordinated tightly. And for, I, I didn't have time to show you the data, but we, when we overexpress in that taxin, mm -hmm. then we can, we can resolve these kind of structures. We can rescue the absence of RNA. Okay, even in the presence of RNA pol 2 yeah. Okay. Probably because uh, senataxin is also acting and is also displacing on April 2. Right. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Something to think about. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Philippe. Uh, great talk. And I think first Thank time you. I'm hearing it, it was wonderful listening to your talk. Although I must confess, I joined a bit late. I missed the initial part of your talk. Oh. <laughs> okay. so my, no. yeah, my question follows from Shweta's. Uh, <clears> so I, I also perturbed about this RNA polymerase degradation. And if at all it has to happen, I would rather that it only the RNA polymerase that is associated with chromatin is degraded, not all the, you know, those which are not actively transcribing, but That's what crazy. you showed the, the blot, it looked like there's a global reduction of, so that is somehow, you know, doesn't gel with what we know about nuclear functions. So if there, there is a uh, 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 a need to degrade, I would rather the cell would degrade RNA polymerase that is transcribing or associated with chromatin. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So that's something we, we still need to do to, to look at specifically at the chromatin bond fraction. And ideally, we would like to do it in by, by, by chip, actually, to look at right. those that are in front of the... But that's to do that, we would need to, to do it... Uh, I mean, we are, we are using asynchronous cells, so, so we don't know where the forks are, so it's a big mess. Yeah. But what we need to do to do the experiment you, you, you proposed in, in properly would be to do it with, um, like, maybe synchronize the cells in G1, let them accumulate in S-phase uh, in the presence of hydroxyurea, 
And then look what happens to our napoleum rays that are just in front of the fork or a bit, a bit further to see if we can detect differences and if it's uh, if the differences are related by the checkpoint. Yeah, but yeah. I had another, yeah. Hmm. yeah, thanks. So I had another quick question about the second part. So I'm just wondering if you have cytosolic DNA, whether single-stranded or double-stranded, is there a possibility of inducing PLR signaling in addition to interferons that you are looking at? What, what, what kind of signaling? Sorry, I missed the, that. The, the, the toll-like receptor. Oh, the toll-like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So has anybody looked at that in your system? Oh, no, yeah. We, 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 yeah, we haven't looked into it. Uh, I, I assume it, it's, uh, yeah, it's also activated, but uh, yeah, we haven't looked into it at all. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We enjoyed your lecture. Definitely. Thank Any you. Any other questions? Anyone else? Hi, Devani. I have a couple of questions. Can yeah, I ask? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, great talk. So I have a couple of uh, small questions. So I was okay. just asking uh, about the very nice model where primary fibroblast, the induction of uh, oncogene uh, RAS V12, and there was an overexpression of claspin and timeless. I was wondering, is there what is the correlation with overexpression of claspin and timeless to the phenotype that we see with the mirin? For example, we know that claspin or timeless, other than being a folk protection complex, they can also activate ATR or mm -hmm. DNA damage response. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if we inhibit DNA damage response in the cells. Can we see the reversal of the effect which we see by Mirin treatment? Mm. So, yeah, we, have, we haven't looked into it. That's a good point. Um, well, the, the only data we have so far is that indeed in the cells that overexpress claspin and timeless, they, they don't have this uh, interferon response. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the... Yeah, we, this this we don't know, but that, yeah, that's a good point. We, we should go back to these clones and and see how they they react when we, we yeah we, we induce replication stress. Also, yeah. I also have just another curiosity because we know that some of these difficult to replicate regions they can be replicated better when we have overexpression of timeless or, or the yeah. same thing I had with the RNA DNA hybrid as well. So. Uh, is there any uh, indication that certain regions of genome is cut more? Like the accumulation of fingers and DNA, is it coming from certain regions of genome which have higher propensity to get difficult, uh, replicate uh, poorly or? Something? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. I, I, I wish we knew that. Uh, the, in this study we did with ELA uh, cells, asynchronous ELA cells, the, the only places where we detected breaks were actually associated to uh, conflicts between highly expressed genes and 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 folks in the head on orientation. And, and this was mostly detected in the absence of topoisomase one. So probably because the, uh, the resolution of positive supercoding was, was a, a problem. Um, whether there are regions like, I don't know, uh, heterochromatic regions or, or centromeric DNA or things like that, you, you would expect to be intrinsically more difficult to replicate. We haven't found that, but uh, probably the, the problem with the kind of study we, uh, we did was that the, the, the level of stress we can detect is very limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, it's very difficult to extract regions over the, the, the noise we have throughout the genome. So we couldn't make sure that this, this kind of enrichment was, was real. But that, yeah, that's maybe again, it's something we could detect better in, in synchronous cells. Mm -hmm and then in, in asynchronous populations. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank thank you. Very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Any more questions? Okay. Uh, Philip, I will ask one more question. Okay. Um, regarding the timeless and claspin overexpression, uh, you mentioned that uh, if you knock down, then it will go back to the. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in mechanistically, what it does to. Uh, oh. Because it is the folk yeah. protection complex involved in the stabilizing the yeah. storm, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do? You, yeah, uh, it, yeah, it's 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 a bit uh, it's it's not, it's not obvious because uh, I mean the 
the stoichiometry of the complex is, is, I think, pretty well known. And you don't expect to having more timeless or having more clasping is not going, in principle, is not going to affect the, the, the for protection complex. But there, there was this um, uh, paper from the, um, the, the lab of uh, Yeri Lucas showing that timeless was acting as a sensor for um, um, oxidative stress. And then it could be displaced from the replication fork. So, so what, what is, and so when the timeless is displaced from the fork, then the fork is, is slower. So, so um, what this, I, I don't know how I can, this would fit with our story, but at least what it means is that the, the binding of timeless to the fork is, is a very um, um, dynamic process. Dynamic. So you could imagine that if you have more timeless in the cell, you know, if timeless and, and clasping fall, falls after the fork on a regular basis, if you have more, if you have a larger pool that is available, then the, 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 you, you would shift the equilibrium the, towards more clasping and timeless at the fork. And have, maybe you, have you checked the levels at the fork? No, <clears throat> no. It's, it's actually very difficult to, to do. Um, I don't know, maybe some like I pond, like an I pond approach, but I don't know, you know, how, how quantitative this would be. <clears throat> if, we, if you normalize it to another factor, like um, CDC 45 or something that is supposed to be there at the fork. <clears throat> yeah, it would be nice to see if, if you have more, uh, if you have a larger pool of free timeless, uh, then if you, if you get more timeless at the fork uh, relative to another more stable protein, like. Uh, yeah, CDC 45. Yeah, that's a good point. But, mm. Okay. Thank you, Philip, for the excellent talk and finding time from your busy schedule for delivering this lecture. We hope to see you in person sometime soon in India. Okay. Yeah. And thanks, everyone, for participating and our IT team for uh, helping with the uh, arrangements and science come. Thank you very much. See you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.